Hello and welcome to Forgotten Fronts. In today's episode, we'll be playing the mission, That Damn Village, in which we take him out of Bula's entire brigade to take the village of Placenor. But first, the history. If you don't want to hear the history, a time will come up on your screen. Wait for it! Now! From 5 to 6.30, Von Hiller's 16th Brigade made an attack, pushing Lobau's troops from Placenor, but were counterattacked by the Young Guard. The Prussians were pushed from the village to the heights east, where they met Russell's 14th Brigade, giving Napoleon some breathing room. By 6.45, Napoleon moved the 11 battalions of the Guard in squares along the Brussels Road, facing the village, denying his flank from the Prussians after Ney's attack on Wellington Center captured La Haison. However, another attack was planned as the Prussian High Command was determined that holding the village would determine the battle, as the village was 765 yards from the rear of Napoleon's final reserve and the route of retreat. The attack commenced at 7 by the 15th and 16th Brigades, supported by the 14th and 13th Brigades. The assault on Place Noir was led by the 16th and 5 battalions of the 14th from the 2nd Silesian Infantry, the 15th Infantry, and the 1st Pomeranian Landwehr, with the 1st Silesian Landwehr in reserve. The Prussians charged forth, capturing the houses to the west and putting pressure on the church wall, but they were repelled. Then two battalions of the Pomeranian Landwehr of the 14th Brigade charged the wall, driving the guards back. In the charge, they captured a hauser, two cannons, several ammunition wagons, two staff officers, and several hundred prisoners. Despite this, the young guard held determinedly as more Prussians arrived, but eventually they withdrew at 7.15. The reason for the frequent exchange of the village is due to the Prussians being mainly militia, some of which being in their first engagement. At the same time, the guard were exhausted from marching with little rest since the 16th. With the Prussians threatening to break through, Napoleon committed two battalions of the Middle Guard, the 1st Battalions of the 2nd Chasseur under Pellet and the 2nd Grenadiers under Morand. They moved towards the village in two columns at the double, charging and sweeping away the 14 Prussian battalions in 20 minutes, pursuing them for 600 yards. However, during a heavy rain, they were counterattacked and withdrew to the church wall. Seeing the Middle Guard, the Young Guard rallied, garrisoning the houses surrounding the church. At 8 after being rallied by Eisenhower and the officers of the 15th, the Prussians made a third and final attack. This was made by the 5th Brigade of Purchase's 11th Corps, supported by the depleted 15th and 16th Brigades, followed closely by the 6th and 7th, moving up. This attack was made in three lines, the 15th Infantry on the right, supported by Landwehr. In the center, the 5th Westphalian Landwehr made another attack. As more Prussians approached the village, the French were outnumbered 5 to 1. Pelet attempted to rally his men, taking the chasseur's eagle and saying, My chasseurs, save the eagle or die by it! Eventually, after an hour and a half of fighting, two battalions of the 16th moved around the south of Place Noir, threatening to cut off the French retreat, and the French withdrew, leaving cannon and ammo wagons behind. In the retreat, Lobau was captured around 8.30. As they were caught between the Prussians and Allied advance, the village was captured at 9 o'clock. Bulo looked to his left and saw the smoke-lined ridge covered in the wreckages of two armies in near constant contest. Bodies speckled it and cannonballs scarred it, with equipment lining it glinting in the fog. To his front he saw the French facing his forces for a desperate brawl to hold him while Napoleon smashed their allies. Bulo sent a courier to von Gatrin's brigade, Sphere Battery No. 5, ordering it to move to the heights south of the Place Noir. When another courier came from von Blücher on a lather blowing horse, on arrival he gave a salute as Chris as if on a parade ground, handing Bulo an envelope written in quickly scribbled handwriting, ordering him to attack the village to his front. After accepting the orders and sending away the courier with a curt salute, he ordered the Sphere Battery No. 3 alongside the other to soften the defenders to flank and surround the village with his infantry brigades. 
Then Gruber sent another courier to order the first Potsdam behind von Gatrin's brigade. The regulars took the leather sheets from their colors, but the wind was too feeble, so the flags hung limp. In response to the colorful targets now in sight, the French gunners readied their pieces. Von Gatrin, seeing the gunners, sent the 2nd Silesian Landwehr Cavalry Regiment forward to capture or disperse them before they can open an iron hail upon them. Von Lawson, on the other side of the field, moved the Fuss Battery No. 14. As the guns moved forward between the ranks of the two regiments, of Silesian Landwehr, the French guns suddenly erupted. French shells shrieked overhead, bursting over the cavalry brigade as von Schwerin moved the right of battery number one in front of the brigade to shield his men as best they could, as he figured the cavalry would be little help in the fighting around the village. Despite what the commander thought, however, a courier arrived requesting cavalry support for the assault on the village, and so he sent the first Magdeburg Hussars to the center. After rattling off so many orders and watching his units move into place, Bula watched as his corps rumbled to life. Then he noticed something wrong. He had moved the wrong battery and so quickly sent a courier to the Schwer Battery No. 3, ordering them to return to their position in the center of the two brigades. At the same time, another courier was sent to the Fuss Battery No. 2 in the wood behind the 16th Brigade, ordering them to the southern heights next to the other batteries. The gunners cursed, knowing that they would have to chop down the trees in the way of the heavy guns. Slow, hot, heavy work, even before the working of the guns. Then came the thunder of drums as von Gatrin moves the first Silesian landwehr south of Prasnoy. Their officers ordered their battalions to shake out their colors with Godmit Uns, which shone brightly in the sudden breeze. The bugles rang out their martial notes as the cavalry charged the French guns north of the village, waving their sabers wildly. Forward, my children! Once we get past the guns, it's like killing rabbits! Bugler, sound the charge! Good hunting, men! The Silesian Landwehr cavalry thundered forth, their mounts hoops kicking up mud as they charged towards the French guns, their guidance rippling in the air. The French gunners' eyes were wide and full of fear as they hurriedly attempted to limber up and haul out. The horses struggled under the massive weight of the limbers as whips cracked over their heads. The cavalrymen screamed their war cry, followed by the cry of their bugle as they pointed their sabers forward, their eyes wild. The French guns rushed away, bouncing at the smallest difference in the ground, the gunners holding on for their lives. From the cloud of cavalry, sabers flashed down like angry lightning bolts, steel cutting down to the bone and rising impressively bloodily. On the right, the two last guns were charged by the cavalry. One was quickly captured, the gunners driven back after several fell to mortal cuts. The commander of the battery was caught up amongst the wild horsemen and was cut down. Then the squadron charged the second piece, when suddenly the ragged, crackling fire came from a nearby French square which opened up on the squadron. Then the cavalry bugler cut through the chaos and the squadron withdrew as a hail of balls cracked around them. On the left, the other squadron reformed after capturing another French piece to charge again to capture the last gun. The squadron rushed forth, waving their sabers in the air, and shortly after captured the gun. However, they refused to charge again as they were too close to the church and risked being fired upon by a garrison. Then the bugler by the commander sounded the recall, but in the din and chaos, only one squadron answered the call. But soon after, the other regrouped and galloped towards the commander. On the left, after the gun was captured, the battery commander fled in panic in the burning gun smoke, but he ran into the squadron who was able to regroup with the rest of their regiment and was captured. In the meantime on the right, in the hail of lead from the square that shrouded it in smoke, they lost another three men falling from their saddles screaming. Their commander ordered their men to return to their lines as the French battalion on the right side of the church shrunk away into the square, awaiting for the cavalry to charge. Von Gatrin then sent a courier to the 2nd Westphalian Infantry to advance along the right flank of the village. The regiment then shuddered to life, starting with the 1st Battalion to the thundering of drums. But soon after, the commander of the regiment organized the battalions to move forward in double line. The 1st Magdeburg Hussars, seeing that the attack was commencing without them, ordered his squadrons to advance at the gallop. Bulo then looked through his telescope to the extreme right flank, debating if he should request more cavalry from von Schwerin to support the attack. However, he quickly decided against it as there was no cavalry to be seen on the right flank. Von Lawson sent the 3rd Silesian Landwehr to support the flanking attack on the village, and they advanced, singing and waving their colors to and fro. At the same time, the first guns arrived in position on the heights to soften up the French defenders, the gunners jumping from their guns and beginning to unlimber their pieces. Noticing the scarce amount of defenders in front of the guns on the left, Von Gatrin sends the 2nd Westphalian Infantry to form a firing line in front of the cannon. Then the Fuss Battery No. 2 moved alongside the Schwer Battery No. 5 at the double. 
The gunners cracking their whips over their horses' heads as the Silesian land wreck continued their approach. After sending the Westphalian regulars to form a line of battle to protect the artillery, Bulow ordered another courier from the 1st Posen, changing their orders to join the attack on the right flank. From the battalions, there was a little grumbling as the battalions quickly reorganized and shuffled to the right flank. The 2nd Silesian line road was also ordered into this attack as well as a reserve unit along the line of hedges. The first two battalions of the Silesian line road had now fallen deadly quiet as they approached the stream towards the left of the village, and the fear began to pump in their throats. Just behind them, the first guns of the Schwer Battery No. 5 arrived and began to unlimber to unleash an iron hail upon the French. As the Hazars advanced down the line, they see the massive men advancing. This was the hand of the Emperor, preparing to rid Europe of the Corsican tyrant and his revolutionary opportunists from Europe once and for all. Overcome by patriotism, they ride across the field as they cheer the advancing battalions. Hurrah! Für der König und Blücher! Waving their sabers in the air and lifting their shakos. The rumble of drums and the martial notes of trumpets ring out from the advancing battalions as they trudge through the mud towards the village. All the while, the guns thundered, spewing smoke and flame from their muzzles, setting the ears of the nearby infantry and cavalrymen ringing. As the battalions advanced, the Silesian line where cavalry continued to withdraw, reveling in the glory of cutting down the gunners at little cost. Thankfully spared the same fate as the French cavalry on the south side of the village who were ground down by the heavy cannonade by the two batteries. Bulow sent another courier to the first Magdeburg Hazars to move their squadrons to the heights and they galloped off to hold the front. As the Westphalian regulars advanced and saw the guns began to unlimber and the gunners waited impatiently for them to pass. At the same time, the first Silesian landmarks splashed across the stream with their muskets raised above their heads and leather covering their muskets' locks. Men's hearts followed the rhythmic thumping of the guns on both sides of the field as the men looked determinedly forward. At the same time, the first Silesian landmark left the stream and began to climb the heights on the French side, their long coats dripping with water. As they advanced, the drummer boy unconsciously quickened their tattoo out of nervousness, causing one battalion to quicken their step until an officer yelled, Damn your eagerness! This is not a race! The battalions of the two regiments moving to attack around the right side of the church still advanced, almost as if in one line. Eventually, the commander of the 2nd Silesian Landwehr halted his battalions farther back. With the threat of our cavalry gone as the Silesian Landwehr cavalry had long withdrawn, the lone French battalion formed into column to take cover in the village buildings as shot and shell from our guns landed and exploded all around them. An officer among them directed them coolly as a shell exploded over their head. On the left of the village, the two battalions of 1st Silesian Landwehr had mostly crossed the stream and was ordered to advance to the road to attack the small French brigade to their front. However, the 1st Battalion was the only battalion in position to make the attack against the brigade. The 2nd Battalion, that would normally cover their right flank, was still across the stream, and the 3rd Battalion, which was in reserve, was too far back to support the attack, but it was made anyway. The Westphalian infantry in the meantime continued to their position on the heights all the while the cannons thundered behind them, deafening them and shrouding them in smoke. As the French battalion retired to the village to take shelter in the buildings, as the French battalion retired to the village to take cover in the buildings, the commander of the first Posen infantry ordered his men to the fork in the road. On the left, seeing the Silesian land were approaching, the small French brigade formed into column to advance and contest them. They hoped to catch the larger brigade unorganized as it was their only chance to defeat them. However, the 1st and 3rd battalions halted and the men primed and loaded, catching one of the French battalions alone. Then a runner from the 3rd battalion alerted the commander that another French battalion was approaching from across the stream, and so he sent the 2nd battalion who was floundering that same stream to face them. The commander of the 2nd Westphalian infantry moved his battalions to the right to face one of the approaching battalions and to defend the guns from the same battalion. The land where men stared down the French battalion, waiting for orders as a single bead of sweat ran down one man's forehead. Fire! Their officer bowled, and the muskets of the 1st battalion crackled in an organized volley. The first casualties toddled bloodily from the front ranks of the isolated French battalion. But after this sudden crash, their officer ordered the men to rush forward a few hundred paces to the right to allow the 3rd battalion to come up and join the engagement. The landlord did so, eager to join the fray, yelling following their bugle sounding in its martial notes. Then the French opened fire, their muskets shrouding in the smoke. One of the landlord men fell screaming and curled up into a ball, before being run over by the men who soon lined up to return fire. Then the two French columns suddenly emerged from the village, yelling, Vive l'Empereur! thumping their kettle drums and advancing, their flag tipped with a golden eagle. 
with no units to counter this movement, with two regiments moving to the flank of the village, until the bugle sounded and the men of the 1st Magdeburg Hussar, weaving around the battalions of Landwehr men, charged forth, spotting them with mud and waving their sabers in the air. They were soon lost in the wild savage joy of the charge, yelling blue liver at the French. The horses' eyes as wild as the men now pointing their curved sabers ahead of them. One of the French battalions halted and their officer bawled at his men to form square, but in the confusion the men formed into line and the hussars broke into a charge. The second battalion also scrambled to form line to blast the approaching hussars. In the meantime, the first battalion managed to get somewhat organized and spat musket fire into the hussars, and one of the horsemen was shot out of his saddle. Then the hussars were on top of them. The French battalion broke ranks and ran for their lives toward the houses. Then we were among the French, slashing sabers falling and bloody sabers rising. We were lost in it, and I was not unmoved. I did not care who I rode over, as I cut to pieces anybody in my way. The squadrons quickly changed direction, charging towards the other battalion, sending them scrambling for the houses, and the chaos and carnage engulfed them as the cries of the men were drowned out by the thumps of hooves. Despite the chaos from the two French battalions just behind them, the trumpets cut through the confusion and their officers ordered their men to form square. Seeing this, the commander of the 1st Magdeburg Hussars ordered the recall. The 2nd and 3rd squadrons continued the charge and were sent reeling as the horses refused to charge the heads of bayonets while a nearby square flamed musket fire into their ranks. The commander of the Hussars ordered his bugle to sound the Rucker Regiment withdrew in a semi-organized mob. Bulo, in the meantime, sent a courier to the 2nd Silesian Landwehr to counterattack the French Brigade. At the same time, the Landwehr on the left held firm and the regulars on the right continued their advance. The Landwehr commander ordered his men forward, sergeants echoing the officer's order as they formed into column of advancing at the double. The squadrons of Hussars regained discipline enough to take orders, but the French did not wait and poured on musket fire, catching a few more horsemen. Despite the French fire, the Hussars are awaited orders, and their commander, seeing the advancing landwehr, ordered his men to form a line with the landwehr once the second Silesian landwehr continued their advance as the first posed the infantry and moved around the right flank, their fusilier battalion halting, eyeing the church waiting for another French sortie as they advanced to the crossroads. The regular commander bawled at them to keep moving, and the officer of the fusiliers looked to protest, but obeyed. The commander of the second Silesian landwehr looked through the dirty mist. From what he could see, the attack on the left wasn't going well, so he ordered his battalions farther forward. Forward, but as they entered the smoke that blew across the field like a thick fog, they began to lose cohesion and the NCOs struggled to close their ranks. Then repeating his orders, they rushed forward in column towards the French brigades attacking from the village. Their commander wanted to quickly push the French back, ordered his men closer to blast them with powerful volleys. The battalions halted separately, forming lines in echelon to the right, catching the French battalion still reeling from the cavalry charge. One of the French battalions moved to support the other who was still in square, when the landwehr commander rode behind in the center battalion. Now, kills us five! One battalion officer yelled, and the center and left battalions leveled their muskets and opened a ferocious hail of lead on the French. The two smoke shrouded French battalions rushed to form their own line, and it was a messy, confused affair as the two volleys hammered into them, causing the men to waver, but they held. On the other side of the stream, the deadly blast of musketry sent one battalion back, rallying by their officer. In the meantime, a company of Jaeger took careful aim and sniped through the gap. The commander sent the battalion forward again as the gap left the two battalions flanks open and the French were already taking advantage of this. The first Posen infantry in the meantime arrived at the crossroads and their commander sent them to the west of the village. The regulars were constantly watched by three French battery commanders who protected a damaged supply wagon with so Behind the church, volleys cracked out as the battalions pumped shot after shot into the nauseating smoke. The men's mouths were dry and gritty from the powder and their nails bled when they dragged back their flints. The second battalion of the first Silesian landwehr suffered under the fire of two French battalions while trapped in the banks of the stream. The commander of the first Silesian landwehr looked helplessly to the solid line of regulars. For God's sake, advance! One battalion alone would surely push those French dogs back! However, the second Westphalian infantry held their ground as the bodies piled up and blood drifted down the stream with the residue of the powder, the regulars squinting into the filthy smoke, trying to find out how the engagement was going. The first post and infantry on the right continued toward the other objective in good order, and Bulo sent the third Silesian landwehr to the crossroad to support them. All the while, the regiments of landwehr around the village poured murderous fire into the French battalions. We were under a murderous hail of balls from the conscripts. Balls that smacked into the walls of the buildings, shattering the stained glass of the church and knocking splinters from the shutters of the houses. One officer rallied the battalion on the right, yelled, For God's sake! Oh! And was cut off as he clutched his face and staggered and fell. 
Three French battalions still suffered under the hill. One of their battalions continued to patrol all the while taking flanking fire. Our men were attempting to load and fire faster to stop the French battalion from reforming, making them miss more in the smoky air. This allowed the battalion to rise, and they sent a company to take cover in one of the houses behind the church. Across the stream, the first Salvation Land were looking increasingly thin as the other two battalions lost cohesion in the effective fire from the small but maneuverable French battalions. The commander of the land were sent forth the first battalion to his left flank, where another French battalion emerged from the stinking smoke fog to flank the third battalion. As the first battalion advanced, the third battalion attempted to fall back to face this new threat. But then the officer of the third battalion was shot through the left eye, and then the battalion broke. By the church, the crackling of fire and the screams of stricken men could be heard through the smoke that parched men's throats and made their eyes sting. The second battalion of the second Silesian Nightmare drew bayonets and rushed toward the flank of the valiant French battalion. Their officer planned to charge the house that the French took shelter in. As the first posen neared his objective on the west side of the village, their officer ordered his men to occupy the houses on their side of the road. By the church, the land were loaded and fired, their mouths salty from gunpowder as their ramrods scraped in their barrels. As the first men of the 3rd Battalion splashed across the stream, the 1st Battalion formed a column to move closer. The landward commander rode along the red stream, hopeless as the nearby Jaegers took careful aim and sniped at the French battalions. At the same time, the 3rd Silesian landward marched past the wreckage of the Hussars on the route to join the 1st Posen on the west side of the village. As they marched, they sung the land Wehrmacht, but more and more voices dropped out as men glanced towards the large clouds of powder smoke by the church, from which sporadic flashes of musket fire could be seen. The fighting around the village was fierce. Men were caked in powder debris and cut up like balls, loading through the paint with sore arms. Suddenly to their left, the 2nd Battalion of the 1st Salvation Landwehr rushed from the bank of the stream, tumbling over one another. It was every man for himself in a chaotic rush. The French brigade then gave a sudden roar of triumph and began to advance, some in call and others firing on the retreating land as they moved. The officer of the 3rd Battalion of the 2nd Salvation Land were ordered his battalion along the hedgerow to put more fire on the French, not seeing the advance across the stream in the smoke. However, he only managed to get his men to shovel forward a few paces. Meanwhile, across the stream, the 1st Battalion of the 1st Salvation Land were retreated, fear and confusion ruling their minds as their commander rode up to rally them. The Jaegers, in the meantime, were left to fend for themselves, their rifles popping at the advancing French columns. This finally got a reaction from the 2nd Westphalian Infantry, their commander moving his line forward and to the right. The regulars were not moving forward to continue the attack of the landwehr, but to defend the guns as ordered. Their second battalion halted short, sending a runner to their commander who galloped to survey the situation on his right flank. In the meantime, the third side of each would continue its march west, their men involuntarily ducking as wolves cracked overhead from the fight by the church. Then a courier rode up to Bulo on a blowing horse with a message that the second cavalry brigade had arrived and was waiting orders, but he held them in reserve for the moment. The fighting was intense as muskets hammered into shoulders and smoke blasted from the barrels of their muskets. The regular commander's gallop slowed to a trot as he ordered the second battalion forward at the devil, spotting a French column around one of the houses who rushed forward in column. The commander of the first side Asian land were galloped across a bridge amongst the remnants of the first battalion, yelling every foul name and curse of the regulars for not supporting his attack. Behind the church, the murderous fire of the second side Asian land were finally began to show its effect as the two French battalions lost cohesion and began to edge back. Another French battalion moving around the flank, seeing the column of Westphalian infantry approach, followed suit. At the same time, the first Posen continued his advance to take up its defensive positions. The second side Asian land were broke one of the French battalions, and shortly after, so did the second battalion of the Westphalian infantry. The French brigade counterattacked, threatening the Jaegers who continued their hellish snipe. Then the French came in range of the regulars, who cut them to bits in a hail of musketry. The, some of the battalions of the first side Asian land were rallied behind the regulars, and the commander ordered them in reserve behind the artillery in marching columns. The Jaeger was caught in the middle of the French attack and were nearly cut down to a man. On the right, the first battalion of the second side Asian land were wheeled to the right to face the other French battalion to their front. On the west side of Place Noir, the first posing spotted a French column in the distance, and so their officer ordered his men to garrison the houses on the other side of the road and to fortify them, then repeated the order for the men in the houses on the near side of the road. At the same time, the third side Asian land were continued its advance to support them. The scene had faded entirely for the men as they became anxious of the coming fight. On the left, shots crashed and voices yelled as the regulars poured fire on the French brigade, and the French battalion soaked up the punishment. The dead and dying rolling down the bank into the stream. Give it to them, 15th! Give them hot hell! Reload! Lively now! And send them screaming back to their emperor! They held us like a brick wall, pouring thick, deadly fire on us from the raised bank, piling us like fish from the market. 
The regulars volley crashed down as an officer bowled out for his men to keep up their fire. By the church, the third side each commander pushed back the front battalion, leaving only one battalion to keep their ranks in the village. The commander of the regiment ordered the second battalion back as moving too far ahead would leave them open to fire from the church, which would no doubt be garrisoned now that the French were thrown back. Bulo saw another opportunity to attack and sent the fourth side each nine way forward in column behind the regular. On the west side of the village, the first posing continued to dig in, putting up boards in the windows, cutting loopholes in the walls, and one man pawed what he could find in a doorway that was open after the French stole the door for firewood that morning. The second battalion of the second battalion of the regulars, arriving late once again, took up a hurried positions on the right. All the while, the third side of the line were advanced to take up positions in the rear, mud spattering their scarred faces. As the second battalion had arrived in positions, they sent counties to the houses on either side of the road to rush and make what fortifications they could. The men made what preparations they could, but not as substantial as those of the other battalions. All the while, from beyond the two rows of houses, a column approached to the slow, menacing pot of charge, thumping as they approached at an angle. Meanwhile, in the rear, Bulo looked at the rising smoke and listened to the pop pop of musketry as a courier arrived, informing him that the first posing were in position with an unknown amount of Frenchmen to their front. After sending a courier to Bulo, the the commander of the regulars sent another one to the commander of the 3rd South Legion Land, where he, in response, formed a double line on their flank. To the east of Plassenwall, two French battalions made another attack and were set upon by the land where once again. Except for the 2nd Battalion, who hadn't had the time to wheel around, and several NCOs from their left-hand companies had their ribs rearranged by musket balls. The officers seeing the dying men and heard the balls cracking around them wheeled the battalion around. They did so at ease at first until their left-hand companies became disorganized, halting the battalion for a moment. Farther to the left, two battalions of the French Brigade weathered the storm of musket balls from the regulars, and both turned on the 2nd Battalion, downing half a dozen men from their leftmost company in a twitching, screaming, bloody heap. The Fusilier Battalion, in response, advanced to the bridge to fire on their flank. They were itching for a fight, as they had missed most of it due to being so far to the flank. To the left, there was a low roll, so French cavalry advanced. This wasn't noticed by the Fusiliers, but thankfully one of the battery commanders did, and they sent a runner to the 1st Magdeburg Khazar, who, so since Cenk and the French advanced, were looking for a real fight, not one from a fierce but helpless opponent. On receiving the report, they almost cheered as they galloped to form a line to the extreme left flank. On the right, the 3rd South Asian Landway continued their march to the west side of the village, all the while looking to the church and the French to their right. Behind the church, the firefight continued as men fumbled with ramrods, swearing while looking through the choking smoke. Bullets thumped into buildings. Chipping flakes off them and shattering the remains of the windows. Men were dying by the minute in the smoking chaos, files closing over the gaps left by the dead. The third battalion of the land room made another rush towards the hedges, but only took a few half hearted steps before halting. The commander of the 2nd West Villain Infantry stood defiantly in front of the 2nd battalion, not noticing the flanking fire until a runner from the left hand company of the 2nd battalion told him. He galloped behind the battalion and rushed until they were parallel to the stream and were able to pour more crackling musket fire onto the shrunken French battalions. Some of the right hand company rushed to occupy another house along the stream, forming small groups to shoot from the windows. By the church, the French held stubbornly, and fighting continued, house by house, garden by garden, and in the alleyways, edge with burning houses and ground thick with dead. On the west side of Place Noir, the 3rd South Asian Landmark continued to march up in support. However, the French column that appeared to be attacking halted, and so the line instead moved to form another line behind the regulars. As the fight in the village continued, muskets crashing and voices yelling in the choking smoke. Farther to the left, one of the French battalions broke ranks and rushed hell for the other to the rear. On the extreme left, the Fusilier battalion formed into spray in response to the French cavalry's approach. The first Magdeburg Hussars formed into line behind the square as the guns on the heights boomed and shells screeched overhead. The shells exploded amongst the French cavalry, who struggled to organize as the horses panicked in the cannonade. The commander of the Fusilier battalion, seeing the approaching French column, ordered his men back into line. All the while, the fight for the village continued, and the Round of musketry creating some little pricks of fire in the smoke as officers blast with orders in thick smoke. On the west side of the village, the 3rd South Asian Landry was nearly in position as the officers of the first posing scanned the French to their front and fear crumpled in their stomach. It was the guard. We must have struck a nerve, gentlemen. He's sending some of his best men. Well, he'll be hitting some of our best. Not conscripts, but dug-in regulars. Our men will show those pampered guardsmen Prussian discipline. 
The men at the first pose looked gravely ahead at the battalion to their front, seeing the red edging on their uniform showing them as a young guard. Their hearts beat in time to the French drums as the sergeant touched the New Testament in his pocket that his mother gave him. Eventually, the commander of the regulars ordered his line behind the first row of houses, leaving only some skirmishers to deny the houses. As his battalions moved back, he yelled to the commander of the 3rd Side Legion Landwehr to take up positions on his right. Two of the Landwehr battalion beyond the houses, supported by the Jaegers, and one behind the regulars. There was a great amount of movement and Flags waved to and fro, drums flourished and trumpets cried as the battalions moved into position. To the east of Place Noir, gunfire shredded the ranks on both sides, leaving hundreds dead and twice as many wounded. To the west, men still moved into position, and to the east, the force of Legion Lenoir arrived in position. Down the line to the north that faced the rest of the French forces there was no movement, but the cannon that supported the divisions hammered the air in an artillery duel, bombarding the French divisions. Shells arced in the air with smoke trailing behind them with a screech. A round shot was sent bouncing down the ranks, killing two and then bouncing up in the air to tear off the arm of a third. The men around them shivered helplessly and another gasped for a horrified breath and vomited. Similar things happened up and down the line. Vulo sent forth a newly arrived 2nd Cavalry Brigade to the fork of the road where they could support the attack on either side of the village. To the west the battalions of regulars crept toward the center of the two rows of houses, and their commander ordered them farther back, no one to prompt an engagement. The young guard in the meantime set up artillery to bombard our troops on the heights. The commander of the regulars rode up to one of the houses and sent out half a dozen runners to each of them to tell the skirmishers to remain hidden and hold fire until the main line opened fire. To the east of the village, the Landwehr broke another combat shrunken division again. Farther to the left, the fuse of the battalion was broken, but the French cavalry was repulsed by the Hussars. The 1st Battalion of the 2nd Westphalian Infantry and, the, and a French battalion on the other side of the stream were both forced into the square, making fat targets for the artillery. Realizing this, the commander of the 2nd Westphalian Infantry requested support with their attack. In the meantime, the artillery in the heights was more focused on dealing with the guards' artillery on the other side of the village. So Bulu sent up the Schwer Battery No. 3. Now that the entire battery was committed to the fight, they had nothing to support. Bulo, after getting reports of the cavalry skirmish on his left, sent a courier to the 3rd Cavalry Brigade to move farther to the left. Von Gatry, seeing the rest of the guns, attempted to order forth the final two battalions of the 1st Side Legion Landwehr to the left of the guns to form a square to halt the cavalry. After they refused to obey, he gallops over to rally the Hazards to make another attack. In the meantime, the two squares exchanged a peppering of fire, though they were only down to a third of their firepower for a regular battle line. To the west of Plasma, the young guard skirmishers crept forward. The first posen was spotted. The third Salish Landwehr moved to form a line on the right side of the regulars as another young guard skirmish company banged away at them. To the east, the second Silesian Landwehr had finally pushed back one of the battalions of the French in front of the church. The Landwehr commander reorganized his men, uniforms splattered with mud, blood, brains, and scorched with powder burns into line under their torn colors. Farther to the left, a squadron of the 1st Magdeburg Hussars clashed with one of the last French cavalry squadrons threatening the left flank. The cavalrymen galloped around one another, slashing wildly with their sabers. Now that most of the French battalions had fled or were forced into square by our cavalry, Bulo ordered the 4th Silesian Landwehr to make their attack on the east side of the village. In the meantime, the second Silesian Landwehr finished reorganizing surprisingly quickly under the cannonade as a round shot thudded nearby, spewing forth a shower of wet earth. To the west, the 3rd Silesian Landwehr moved two battalions supported by the Jaegers to the right of the 1st Posen, leaving the 3rd Battalion in reserve. At the same time, the French skirmishers fired from the smoke, their balls cracking overhead. The 3rd Silesian Landwehr attempted an attack, but were halted by the regulars who would not allow them through their firing line, and so they moved around to the flank.
comes one of their columns. Open fire on the swine or the stickers like stuck rats! Shiza, if they didn't know we were here, they do now. Fire on the skirmishers and take them out before their column arrives. Seeing the approaching brigade of the guard, the colonel of the regulars lowered his telescope slowly, whimpering. The men looked as well, some of them shaking in fear, but all of them fixed the enemy with a stare, their imaginations torturing them as the thundering drums approached. Seeing a gap in their line, the officer of the 3rd Battalion moved up to fill it before the guards attacked. While to the east, the Forsyth, while to the east, the Forsyth Legion linewear continued their advance to the drifting smoke, flags fluttering in the breeze as the cannon hammered to their left, causing men to flinch. In the meantime, the two battalions of the 1st Side Legion linewear were fully rested and rallied. Their commander who stopped just short of the battery stared at them blankly as they fired, blanketing the heights in smoke. Behind him, one of the squadrons of the 1st Magdeburg Hazars took heavy fire from a nearby square, one man yelling, I'm hit! I'm hit! and clasping a hand to his face before falling to the, from his saddle. Eventually, the commander of the squadron ordered his men back out of the musket fire, giving the French cavalry squadron a chance to escape. Infuriated by this, the commander of the Hazars sent forth the 1st squadron to charge the cavalry, and their horses thundered forward to a trumpet, the men screaming and saber slashing his through the air. To the west of Plasnoir, the skirmishers fought amongst the houses, cracking away at each other. The French skirmishers gathered in parties to storm the houses using musket butts and whatever improvised weapons they could find. As the loud thumping of the drums of our French brigade drew closer, the commander of the 1st Posen rode back alongside his men and the 3rd Battalion of the Landwehr rushed into their position on the right flank, the commander of the Landwehr taking a drink of strong spirits to calm his nerves. When a French battalion to the right of the houses opened a great volley on the 3rd Battalion, their bullets whistling, killing and mangling many who fell screaming and twitching. Seeing the other battalions, the Landwehr commander saw his chance to strike and wheeled his battalions to position. Capitalizing on the guardsmen's disorganization, the Landwehr commander ordered two of his battalions forward to break their flank as they advanced. The 1st Battalion advanced into position, their companies almost gliding into place. The same could not be said of the 2nd, who shuffled forward and became severely disorganized, and so they were put into reserve behind the 1st Battalion. And so the commander moved up the Jaeger to support the lone battalion. The battalions were ordered to send out skirmish companies, who rushed through the smoky air to kneel and clatter fire to the guardsmen. The company from the 3rd Battalion was first, but as they left, the guards fired into the smoke, and several men tumbled down with blood-curdling screams. Then the skirmish company from the 1st Battalion advanced far more gingerly, but made it through fine. Farther down the line, the 1st Posen were mostly out of the fight, the houses acting as a break bar to the blue tide, except for the 2nd Battalion, who leveled their muskets in a volley crash into the guardsmen, causing them to shudder, then halt, to return fire. To the east of Place Noir, the Force High Legion line were across the stream that was littered with dead, dying, and broken guns to make their attack. Far behind them, the leading elements of the 3rd Cavalry Brigade trotted through the woods. When a rider from the Hazars rode up to the commander of the brigade, his saber resting on his shoulder, and if they moved to support, the Hazars wouldn't be able to halt them. So the commander of the Cavalry Brigade sent forth a courier to the closest cavalry troop, ordering forth the 2nd New York Landwehr Cavalry Regiment at the double. In the meantime, after another fierce melee, the French squadron was sent back by the Prussian Hazars. However, in doing so, they were in a similar predicament as their fellows, as the French squares muskets cracked down on them. Our cannon responded, and the men in two sections of the square were quickly changed into two heaps of offal as round shot whipped through their ranks. As their sergeant rushed to close the ranks, the 1st Battalion rushed to form a line and fire onto the square. At the same time, the 4th Legion line were across the stream and were now under fire from a battalion from the stone bridge. On the other side of the village, through the filthy banks of rolling smoke, a column of guardsmen hurtled toward the center of the 1st Posen. The guards rushed home with their bayonets flashing and with a hellish roar as the regulars charged to meet them, and with a mighty crash, the two formations met. Chaos and confusion reigned as the men thrusted musket butts and drove at each other with bayonets. The fighting was fiercest around the regulars' colors, where the color bearer and the guard fought off three guardsmen. A guard lunged for the color guard, who knocked him to the ground with the butt of his rifle, then rammed his bayonet down and kicked it free. The color bearer parried a few cuts for, with the staff of their colors before one of the guards made a cut to his head, leaving a great gash rolling blood as he fell to the ground, dropping the color. As the guards stooped to pick them up, the bearer snarled, drawing his saber, and went after the man like a cornered animal, slashing wildly with his saber, punching the guard in the face with the saber's handguard while he was stunned, giving him a mortal cut to his shoulder, spouting blood. The color bearer moved back to the center, groggy from his wound, taking up the color and planting it in the ground when a shiny point suddenly grew from his chest and he fell to his knees with a terrible bubbling scream. The guardsmen then hefted the color aloft in triumph. The guardsmen then hefted the captured color aloft in triumph, his tunic splattered in blood, the color guard behind him with his skull shattered. As the first battalion broke, the commander of the first posing saw another column of guardsmen approaching the center, and so he ordered the second and fused leader battalion to wheel and rake their flanks with musketry. At the same time, the guards took many of the first battalion prisoner. Few escaped through our lines as the guards 
charge were formed. In the rear, another courier rode up to Bulo, informing him that most of the reserve artillery had arrived. As for the west, a great crashing volley came from a fusilier battalion on the unorganized guards. Then the second battalion wheeled and unleashed a cracking roar of musket fire into the two guards' battalions across the road. To their right, another brigade of young guard approached the Landwehr regiment, who were suffering under their fire, driving the skirmish company from the first battalion back. Eventually, they broke ranks and ran to the rear, yelling that it would be suicide to stay there. In response to the new brigade, the commander of the third Salesian Landwehr moved to the eagers farther to the right and moved the second battalion into line. Between the two lines, the second battalion of the regulars and the third battalion of the Landwehrs, volleys of musketry shot the guards into a bloody halt. Farther down the line, the fusiliers pumped shot after shot into the filthy fog, pushing back with the guard battalion, following them with a great jeering yell. Then they rushed forward to fill in the gap to save as many of the men of the 1st Battalion from capture. To their right, the landlord were sharply engaged and their casualties were heavy, but the men held, loading and firing at the outnumbering elite troops. The commander of the landlord ordered the 3rd Battalion to line to fire into the flank of the nearby guards' battalion. On the left flank, the cannon fired, their round shot screeching low over the attacking 4th Side Legion landlord. From our position along the banks, we saw the attack of the 2nd Battalion across the Valley of Death. The men dropped like flies as they advanced, to their flags flapping and their kettle drums thumping. My stomach churned and I vomited, and I knew if we crossed, we would face the same fate. Confusion ruled the landlord's assault as one battalion rushed to the rear, their officer roaring at them to stand fast after two French battalions advanced and unleashed a blast of musket balls on them as they crossed the stream. While the battalion on their flank moved up unsupported and was forced into square as cavalry lurked in the smoke across the Valley of Death, the name given to the area now filled with the bodies of the men from the failed assault. The commander of the landlord ordered the first battalion to form a battle line and fire on the French battalion by the stone bridge, trading the threat of cavalry to deal with the more imminent threat of the battalion's fire. Across the stream, the fuse of the battalion fire clattered as they attempted to crack their way into the square as they fired on the nearby Hazar squadron. To the west of the village, the streets were fogged by powder smoke and puddled with blood. The commander of the West Valley regular, seeing that peril had increased with another guard battalion approaching him and two battalions approaching his left flank, and so he ordered the last two battalions of his regiment back as balls flew high somewhere over his head. And then one of the guard columns continued to advance and the Fusilier battalion charged them, screaming, causing them to falter for a moment. The commander ordered the Fusiliers back, not wanting to lose another battalion captured, but hearing the order, the battalion stumbled, then lost cohesion and retreated. Then he ordered the 2nd Battalion to fall back along the land and fire on the reorganizing French battalion's flank. To the far right, the Jaegers took heavy fire from the guard skirmishers and broke, some of the men turning to fire their rifles as they withdrew. The line where commander in response set up the 2nd Battalion to extend his flank. The men began to move, but then halted as musket balls cracked overhead or thudded into the other battalion. To their left, the 2nd Battalion withdrew, crashing through a hedge field in heavy column, and, and to the left of the 2nd Battalion, the fusiliers surprised regrouped as three guard battalions unleashed a storm of fire which forced the battalion back, revealing piles of bodies, blood, and bones. As they bumbled back, one of the French battalions turned, exposing their flank to the now reformed 2nd Battalion, who leveled their muskets and flint snapped on prisons, unleashing a hail of fire. Which disrupted the French battalion for enough time to allow the fusiliers to reform their battle line, they quickly busied themselves with loading their muskets. Once they arrived in position, they fired a ragged volley into the battalion to their left, while being supported by the 2nd Battalion, who fired on the unit on their right. In the center, the leading elements of the 2nd Cavalry Brigade was nearly in position. Their commander took out his spyglass to look over the field. To his left, things looked relatively stable. However, to his right, he saw the hard-pressed regulars and said the 2nd West Prussian Dragoons to check the French battalions advancing on the regulars' left flank. The Dragoons let out a great roar as they rolled forward, waving their swords in the air. As the thumping hooves of the cavalry drew near, the cracking muskets of the regular battalions soon sent one of the guard battalions into disorder. To the left of the village, the 2nd Silesian Landwehr held the f Across the Valley of Death, the 1st Battalion of the 4th Silesian Landwehr was forced back into square by another rush from the French cavalry. One of the nearby battalions fired into the square, chewing one of the corners to pieces, and so their commander moved to rally the nearby men there. While to the extreme left, the French squares battering fire pushed back a squadron of the Hazars. Seeing this, the commander of the 1st Silesian Landwehr moved his battalions forward through the smoke bloated air to face them and the squadron on the extreme left. In the meantime, the 2nd Battalion of the 4th Silesian Landwehr followed their tattered flags in the musket smoke to fire on the flank of the battalion who fired on our square. The commander of the newly arrived 2nd Newmark Landwehr Cavalry clapped his spyglass, seeing an opportunity with the collapsing French battalion, drawing his saber and ordered the advance to sweep them and the cavalry back. His men whooped and rode for it. As luck would have it, the French square broke shortly afterward. The 1st Battalion's fire tore them apart, leaving orderly ranks of dead and dying men. 
To the west of the village, the charge of the dragoons had halted the guard battalion's attack, and one rushed into square, and shortly afterwards, so did the other, leaving them a tempting target for the nearby fusiliers. The musketry of the second battalion of the first posing infantry pushed back another column of the guard. To the right, the fight was still going hard, as the two battalions of land were desperately held back by three of the guard battalions. Their dirty blue clad figures continued to fire their ragged volleys, muttering curses as they reloaded, hoping the guard don't rush forward in the sudden attack. Then a guard battalion formed a battle line on their right, and the commander of the landwehr began to withdraw, beginning with the 1st and 3rd battalion alongside the 2nd battalion. As a fresh column of guardsmen emerged from amongst the houses, one of the battalions in the square returned into battle. On the left, the cowardly 3rd battalion of the 4th Silesian landwehr took the long way around the line while the other two battalions were set upon by the now reinforced French battalion. The exasperated 1st battalion of the 2nd Westphalian infantry advanced into the valley thick with smoke to support the left side of the landwehr with their left flank supported by the cavalry. As the muskets in the landwehr square banged away at the surrounding troops, the French cavalry squadron, seeing the fresh troop of cavalry approaching, withdrew, sending one man to report the new attack and once again the battalion moved to form a battle line to focus on the French battalion by the stone bridge. On the right, the two regiments held determinedly, slowing the guards' counterattack, inflicting many casualties. The land where on the far right were threatened as a column of guardsmen began to advance through the smoke, their drums rhythmically thumping and their bawling, VIVE L'EMPEREUR! Farther down the line, the Fusilier Battalion began to lose cohesion, their volleys becoming thinner and more ragged as they began to take paces back. Seeing this, the regular commander ordered the battalion back this beginning of fighting retreat. Then on the far right, the landwehr heard a great hoarse cheer from the attacker which filled the air as three guard battalions advanced, and the 2nd and 3rd battalions seeing this began to give way. So the landwehr commander ordered the 1st battalion back to refuse a flank to the guards, but just as he finished giving the order, the 2nd battalion broke, so he ordered the 1st back at the double. Then he got back, rallying the 3rd battalion with a wave of his saber, yelling, Stand men, those old men will be out of breath before they reach us. Best make sure they don't arrive and embarrass embarrass themselves and the conscripts let out a loud jeer and a crashing volley. To the right, the regulars hold was tenuous. The guard battalions were beyond the line of houses, which were to act as a save to break up the guard's line. However, the men still held, officers yelling and rankers crashing out musketry, the men filthy and sweaty as the guards continued to advance. On the left, the reinforcing French battalion had arrived, and the leftmost battalion of the 2nd Silesian Landwehr shot a ragged volley into their flank, while the two battalions crossed the valley with the cavalry supporting their left, forcing the nearby French battalion into square. All the while, our batteries fired on the square, one round shot falling well short and throwing chunks of mud into the air, and the guard artillery boom almost as one in response. The officer of the 1st Battalion of the Regulars ordered his men forward through the lingering powder smoke to fire in and disperse the square to let the cavalry clear the way to the objective. To the east of the village, one squadron of the 2nd West Prussian Dragoon were driven back, and the two guard battalions prepared to attack once again, one forming column to move into the flank of the 2nd Battalion of the Westphalian Regulars. The commander of the Dragoons regrouped his men and sent his troop forward again to halt the columns. The guards crept forward through the billowing smoke, again rhythmically chanting and firing from the smoke as they advanced. However, seeing the new column approaching their flank, the 2nd Battalion of the Regulars withdrew to the far side of the hedge line field. To their right, the 1st and 3rd Battalion of the Landwehr also fell back, but their officers were reluctant to follow the order. As their balls had struck home with such brutal efficiency that they had caused one guard battalion to fall back and another to lose cohesion, which as the two battalions withdrew, they began to reorganize. As the two battalions were formed, the commander of the 3rd Battalion staggered to a halt, blood pouring down his tunic as he fell to his knees, causing his battalion to break. However, this left a perilous gap in our line, and the commanders looked around to fill it. Thankfully, in the rear, the first squadron of the first Westphalian Hussar charged the gap to the trumpet, their horses' hoofs thumped, and their snuffle chains clinked as they moved to halt the columns. In the rear, Bruno received another courier with another bad report and desperate pleas for reinforcement. The battery in the center continued to pound the French division in the center. While to the west, while to the west of the village, the Hussars continued to advance, throwing up wet clods of earth and trampling dead and wounded in their path. As they got close, the guards heard the approaching horsemen and began to form into line. The hussars then broke into a charge, scattering the skirmishers. However, the line held fast and their muskets flamed, repulsing them. As the hussars withdrew, several horsemen were shot from the saddle and rolled along the ground, screaming. In their panic retreat, the squadron withdrew in front of the 2nd Battalion of the regulars, and they began to take friendly fire. Farther to the left, another column of guardsmen emerged from the houses, and the regulars crashed a volley into them. The 1st Squadron of the West Prussian Dragoons made another charge at the advancing horse. Farther to the left, another column of guardsmen emerged from the houses, and the regulars crashed volley after volley into them. Then the 1st Squadron of the West Prussian Dragoons made another charge at the advancing guardsmen, waving their sabers in the air to drive them back. However, they were forced to halt when the guards formed into another square. Seeing this, an unpopular plan was formed by the commander of the 2nd Westphalian Infantry. We need your squadrons to fill the gap. No! They will be cut to pieces! If you do nothing, they will be overwhelmed! 
It must be nice to live in such a clear conscience after leaving so many widows and orphans. If we do nothing, there will be more widows and orphans. The first squadron of the 1st Westphalian Hussars were taken aback at first, but their officer ordered them to rush to the guard the left flank of the regulars. The badly bloodied 3rd Battalion of the Rhine Rear rallied to an advance to fill the gap between the 2nd and Fusilier Battalion of the regulars. To their left, the commander of the 2nd Westphalian Dragoons called off the attack and held position alongside the Fusilier Battalion. The 1st squadron of the 1st Westphalian Hussars split into two groups, one forming the order while the other attempted to return to their regiment until their commander roared as loudly as he could and galloped over to fill in the gap. The 3rd Battalion was ordered to get the double under their torn colors, but they halted just short, unleashing a crash of a volley into the squares. In the center, defiant of orders, the 1st squadron of the 2nd West Prussian Dragoons galloped hard, their horses white with sweat towards the flank of one of the guard battalions, but confused in the smothering smoke and crash of fire, they charged towards a nearby square. However, seeing the hedge of bayonets and another square forming on their flank, they withdrew. To the east of the village, the 4th Side Legion Landwehr had broke the French battalion on the other bank, and their commander ordered the regiment forward in double line to the road ending in a stone bridge that was chipped with musket balls. The men struggled to advance over the bodies of the dead and injured who called out for aid through the smoke. The regiment slowly began to advance, starting with the 1st Battalion. The 2nd Battalion followed, however they had to cross the Valley of Death under a hill from a nearby small French battalion by the stone bridge. Seeing this, the commander of the 2nd Side Legion Landwehr moved his two remaining battalions and pushed back the lone French battalion. The 2nd Battalion of the 2nd Westphalian Infantry also saw this and rushed forward as their skirmishers snapped away the battalion from the nearby house on the right flank. On the far left, the advance was going well. The relatively fresh squadrons of the 2nd Newmark Linewear Cavalry easily swept aside the French squadrons after a few minor skirmishes. However, this left the troops separated with one squadron alone with the commander on the other side of the stream that formed a right angle to the Valley of Death. So the French cavalry troops sent their last squadron to attack and rout our squadron, killing our commander in the process. Our commander in response ordered his men to reorganize on their position at the double. Seeing this movement, the French squadron splashed towards them, their bugler blaring with their commander at the lead. The first squadron obliged them, charging towards them and grouping with their sabers pointed forward, hoping to catch them in the stream. Another courier rode up to Bulo, his face blackened with powder, thrusting a message into his hands. It was another plea for reinforcements. As to the east of the village, a column of the young guard charged the final two battalions of the Landwehr, who threw down their muskets and ran. They now regrouped, preparing to attack again to sweep down the flank of the remaining Prussians. As the column turned, the first squadron of the first Westphalian Hussars, without orders, pricked back their spurs and galloped forward to send them back. The cavalry thundered forth, scabbards slapping against their thighs as they rode hard through the drifting smoke. Seeing the advancing squadron covering their flank, the commander of the Westphalian regulars turned to the 2nd Battalion and roared them to withdraw over the flashing barks of musketry. The battalion withdrew, and the semi-organized column passed their shed to the hedges of the beginning of the next field as balls cracked past their officer, ordering the company of skirmishers into the shed to cover the retreat. In the center, the commander of the 2nd Cavalry Brigade turned to the nearby right battery number 12, who had presently firing in the French on their left. The brigade commander ordered them forward to the next fork in the road to fire on the advancing guard. On the far right, the Hazard's charge had made little effect except halting the guard who formed into square, so the squadron galloped back to the hedge where the 2nd Battalion organized itself into line again, as shells exploded like great thunderclaps over the nearby Landwehr Battalion. Then the squadron wheeled, lurching forward, galloping towards the French officer by their commander, who was obviously holding them captive. Mein Gott! The commander! Squadron, at the gallop, advance! Let's cut down that French swine before the officer is captured! <laughs> Squadron, halt! Sir, that swine is attempting to capture you! Do as you're told, sir! This swine is an opponent from my old university days. We both have the scars from the series of slaggers we fought to prove it. The officer rode off to look to the other squadrons to cover the retreat, satisfied that the French officer would not be harmed. The Hazar squadron rode towards the French officer, and the commander of the squadron quickly split the guts of the man with his saber, and they ordered his own back to the hedge which they were ordered to withdraw to originally. As they withdrew, the regulars continued to hammer musket fire into the young guard, many of their battalions forced into square by cavalry lurking in the smoke. To the east of the village, the small French battalion defending the bridge was surrounded by a ring of fire from three of our battalions. The first two battalions of the four Salesian Ladder was ordered forth, their colors tattered and their faces blackened by powder smoke. They advanced to the planned strong point, seeing the pinpricks of flashing musketry to their right and the great flashes of cannon to their front in the smoky air, while the 1st Battalion of the regulars covered their left flank. Then the men of the 2nd Battalion of the Westphalian Infantry plunged forth with bloodthirsty howls as they ran shots whistled past them. To the west of the village, the ragged line still held as the guards advanced and were forced into closely packed squares. All the while, the Prussian regulars focused on loading, pulling their hammer back, pouring some of the powder from their cartridges in their pan and the rest down the barrel, pushing the musket bolt down the barrel. On the new right flank, a young guard column advanced. Th through the thick smoke and confusion, the Prussians could see the gleams of banners. Waiting for them in the thick smoke was a severely bloody land of the time and the wild-eyed haggard men of the 2nd Battalion of the opposing regulars, who opened another crackle of musketry. 
The commander of the first list lay in his arms, which was drawn upon hearing the actions of the officer of the first squadron, so upon hearing the advancing column, he sent them through the mails to her bullets to halt the column. So the cavalry were sent out once again, rumbling forward, crushing the bushes in their wake. They obviously weren't going to ride through the regular firing line, and so they halted briefly on their flank. But they were threatened by their commander, who drew his pistol, and the squadron moved forward once again. The squadron rolled forward again, but they were too late, forcing the guard into square and halting them but not driving them back, only halting their advance. On the left flank, all seemed relatively quiet except for the distant booming of guns who continued their artillery duel. The second battalion rushed to take a position in the walled cemetery that surrounded the abandoned Valsgard church. The two battalions of the 4th Silesian Landwehr continued their advance to the clutch of houses that overlooked the two French batteries, with the 3rd battalion trailing in the rear. The batteries boomed, exchanging round shot, which landed shaking the earth as if an earthquake had hit as they plowed into the soil. The distraught officer had no problem sending in the squadron into the fray again to stop the attack. By now they were tired, listless, and were about done. The squadron charged in front of one of the battalions who waited with raised musketry in the smoke until the squadron was beyond the shed. They blazed musketry, which exploded with a crack of noise. Many of the horsemen went down, hurling some of the men from their mounts, some going down with grunts as if kicked, and others went down with horrible bubbling screams as they bled to death after being hit in the lung. As the thundering hooves of the hussars approached, the cavalrymen wildly slashing left and right, causing the French battalion to flee with surprising cohesion. However, the columns behind them had plenty of time to form a square. So the commander of the squadron ordered his men back. The horsemen wheeled about, yelling and cursing between the two battalions, and so they held on. So the officer of the squadron ordered his men back, and the horsemen wheeled about, yelling and cursing between the two battalions, and so they held on. All the while, the battalions continued to unleash crackling musketry into the advancing guards before drawing their cartridges, priming their muskets, before casting about and pouring the rest of the powder down the barrel, pushing the ball down their muzzles. In the rear, there was a backup of units who began to grumble that the others were in danger, but nobody watched to go forward. There was so much arguing and blustering on the order from General Blucher on whether to send assistance to Wellington's forces or to continue the attack on the village. Eventually, Blucher ordered forth the first Pomeranian line to reinforce the right, and they set off much like the land of the other brigades of the corps, singing with their colors proudly waving in the breeze. On the right of the village, the guard were halted in their square, suffering under the weight of the musket balls. In the meantime, the 2nd Battalion of the West Valley and Infantry took up positions around the stone wall of the church, while to their left, the 4th Silesian Land took up their defensive position in the houses. The men of the 2nd Battalion looked down from their elevated position into the powder haze of the right flank in horror, seeing their fellow regulars pushed back. Hoping to support them, they fired on one of the nearby squares, however, they were just out of musket Shot, their balls fell smacking harmlessly into the ground nearby until one of their officers stopped them. Somewhat encouraging was when another guard battalion packed into square took grievous casualties and was sent back and with their torn colors and a hail of musketry. However, there was no cause to celebrate as four of the columns threatened the far right flank, but the squadrons of cavalry protecting their flank forced them to halt their advance and to close into square to be torn apart by musket balls. When suddenly on the left, the advancing men were heard a low rumbling coming from their left. Now then, they're isolated! Now sweep those plowmen across the stream! The commander ordered his men to form squares around the houses, but the two battalions did not listen and rushed away. The officer ordered them to halt. Thankfully, they did not throw down their muskets in their chaos. The second battalion formed a square by their commander, and their officer yelled at him to take shelter within it. The first battalion, in the meantime, rushed forward to the fine open ground to form a square, when lances emerged from the alleyway to level their points, but when they saw the square, they halted abruptly, and some of the horses in the first rank reared. This gave time for the first battalion to keep moving and eventually form a square. The third battalion rushed up the road to join the rest of the regiment. They heard the bugle faintly, but not clear enough to hear the commander of the nearby artillery batteries. On seeing the squadrons of Lancers, they rushed off the road to see the other battalions in square and did likewise. To the right of the village, the line held ferociously. The French lines only held back by nearby squadrons who faced a heavy hail of musketry but endured it stoically. On the far right, two columns threatened to flank the line, and so the second squadron of the first Westphalian Hussars wheeled to face them, their slow trot turning quickly into a gallop. One of the battalions formed into line and spat fire at the approaching cavalry, and the battalion on their right flank formed into square. Seeing that their charge would be fruitless, the commander ordered the withdrawal, but they got lost in the smoke and withdrew down the French firing line. After the horse of an NCO was shot, the man was left trapped under his mount. The troop lost cohesion, and the rest of the squadron followed. The first squadron fared far worse as most of their squadron was torn apart by French musketry. The horsemen responded with an ineffective popping of pistols that were neither accurate nor lethal at the distance the French were at. All around them lie many horses and men in a pool of blood from which pitiful cries for help and screams of pain from men and beasts could be heard. The second squadron rallied by the shed where the skirmishers of the second battalion had taken in position. However, the skirmishers had long abandoned the house after the approach of the guard, leaving it with powder scorched and bullet chipped walls. Likewise, the second squadron also withdrew to the rest of the regiment in the hedges behind the house. In the rear, more reports came in, and on the left, the situation seemed relatively quiet as the French were driven back and some units needed to reorganize by the stream. 
However, at the defensive position, it was almost the exact opposite of what was happening on the right flank, as the battalions of the Fort Southern East Line were, were held in square by the Lancers, but instead of the infantry tearing them apart, it was the French cannon. Then on the right flank, the first squadron of the first West Valiant Hussars broke into the heavy fire. With the guns of the horse artillery laid facing the guard troops, they provided a deadly supporting fire for the last three battalions on the flank. The cannon cracked, sending a solid shot hurtling down the ranks, disemboweling and tearing off limbs. Despite this, the young guard reorganized and continued their advance. As the young guard advanced, the men on the right knew that their flank was exposed and the cavalry there was exhausted, and so sent for the support of the 2nd Side Legion Landmark Cavalry Regiment, who were fully rested. As since their charge to disperse the French cannon at the beginning of the engagement, they had sat and waited for orders, and now they moved to the right of the battery. Meanwhile, on the left flank of the defensive position, the squares of the 4th Side Legion Landmark snapped fire on the Lancers, sending one of their squadrons back. All the while, round shot crashed all around them, plowing into the earth that shook as if an earthquake had hit. The Lancers, seemingly satisfied to let the cannon tear the squares apart, withdrew most of their squadrons. Seeing the success of the right battery number 12, Bulo ordered the Strayer battery number 3 alongside them to support the failing right flank. Farther to the left, the French cavalry pushed back a squadron of the Landwehr cavalry, only halted by the Fusilier Battalion Square. So the commander of the 1st Magdeburg Hussars ordered his men along the stream behind them to prepare to countercharge. Now that the church was captured, Bula made plans to find the guards, ordering the 2nd Side Legion Landwehr along the stream by the stone bridge by the church. On the right, the guards advanced again, and the officer of the first person ordered his men to withdraw, and the battalion formed column and rushed back. This was mostly as intended except for the 2nd Battalion, who were quickly redirected by a nearby officer. The leading unit of the young guard rattled a volley into the retreating French battalions, however, before they could continue their fire, the 3rd Squadron of the Westphalian Hussars charged forth. They roared, waving their sabers, and from the French perspective, they suddenly emerged from behind the house. They rushed in, hitting the lead battalion and forcing them back, while the two battalions behind them formed a square. Seeing this, the squadron retreated. At the same time, three battalions formed a new defensive line to unleash more fire onto Napoleon's chosen infantry. Left flank and the stalemate continued, giving the French guns more time to bombard the squares. In response, Bula moved the Fuse Battery No. 2 to the lip of the Valley of Death in hope of making a more effective counter battery fire. On the right flank, the French battalions were halted in square, but for how long the officers didn't know, and so the Strayer Battery No. 3 was ordered forth of the double. The cavalry along this front was worn down more and more, and the squadrons furthest to the front rode down the line to halt the French battalions. The officer of the first squadron, the West Prussian Dragoons, looked at a lone French square whose corner had been blasted open, but eventually decided it against charging it. As the cavalry rode down the line, the French squares banged away at them with little retaliation from the cavalry, the battery commander earlier ordering his guns to prioritize fire on the infantry battalions. As the cannonade continued, the first marching columns of the first Pomeranian land rear arrived behind the Schwer Battery No. 3. As on the left, the bombardment continued, the squares were left paralyzed as the Lancers were poised to charge at any moment as round shot rained all around them. As a round shot went wide, plowing into the ground, some of the skirmishers rushed into the buildings nearest the squares, leaning out of the windows to take pot shots at the Lancers. But the situation had got dramatically worse as the commander of the 15th Brigade, who had ridden up to rally the brigade, was caught up by the Lancers. The commander of the Landwehr rode off to the order the guns to fire on the Lancers so the Landwehr's cavalry support could run off the batteries. At the same time, the commander of the 4th Landwehr rode off to order the guns to fire on the Lancers so the Landwehr's cavalry support could run off the batteries. At the same time, despite the protests of the officers of the battalions, the commander of the 15th Brigade rode between the squares, shouting encouraging words to the battalions to hold their ground. After a cannonball ripped down the edge of the 2nd Battalion Square, and after after taking such extreme casualties in the fight so far, they broke. The 3rd Battalion, looking to redeem themselves, formed a maneuver column and rushed up to form a square alongside the commander of the 15th Brigade. However, both commanders ran in panic as they believed the 1st Battalion would soon follow suit and this sentiment being shared by the commander of the French Lancers, who sent another cavalry squadron through the alley.
Both commanders, however, seeing the 3rd Battalion rush up to Form Square, they rode back to take shelter behind it. As the first battery number no. 2 arrived in position, the nearby commander of the 1st Magdeburg Hussar saw the fleeing battalion and ordered his troop to charge forth to run off the battery and bombard the land rear. The right flank had stabilized as the cavalry moving around the line had halted the advance of the young guard battalions. However, with the arrival of the 2nd Silesian Nine Rear Cavalry Regiment to relieve them, they can move to the rear and rest. They were beginning to do this when farther to the right they spotted another French advance around the house, so the 2nd squadron rode out again. Farther to the left, the Schwer Battery No. 3 had arrived in position and was opening up on the French battalions, and just behind them, the Pomeranian Line were, were patiently awaiting their orders to begin their flanking attack, but they had to await a little longer. Then on the left, the 1st Battalion and the 4th Silesian Line were also broken with the artillery fire. As the Line were sent back from their defensive position, the French Lancers moved forward, cutting down as many of the skirmishers who attempted to escape. The commander of the Line were eventually ordered his last battalion back across the Valley of Death. The Fusilier Battalion moved forward, following the advance of the 1st Magdeburg Hussars to recapture the defensive position, moving to the stone bridge to form a new square. On the right, the cannonade continued, and a Hauser made a muffled coughing sound and sent another shell screeching into the young guard battalions. Then the Pomeranian Line Rear was finally sent orders, and the large battalions shuffled as they began to move. They formed a double line on the flank of the last three battalions. Farther to the right, the second squadron of the first Westphalian Hussars was recalled to the far side of the hedgeline field. At the same time, another French battalion scrambled to the rear due to the cannonade. Seeing this, the first battalion of the second Westphalian infantry moved up to fire on the other battalion held in the square. At the same time, the large battalions of the 1st Pomeranian Land were from marching column to line of battle, passing through the Schwer Battery No. 3. To the left, behind the defensive position, the 3rd Battalion halted to form square, stopping one of the Lancer squadrons. In response, the 1st Battalion of the 1st Westphalian Infantry moved more directly toward the defensive position. To the right, the French sent out three skirmish companies around the flank, so the 2nd Squadron of the 1st Westphalian Hussars rode out to send them back. That is when Bulo called off the attack to regroup to make another attack with their freshly arrived men covering the retreat of the cavalry.
Kommen Sie her. Sie ist ein Offizier. The savages. They won't stick me. Selber konnten in seinem Panhaus. Oh God, I'm in hell. No, not quite hell. Jasper. Well, here, Jasper, you're not in the spiritual hell, but a mad maiden. Welcome to Papua Farm. Since the French are threatening this flank, we have gathering the wounded here. Damn Prussians thought we were the French. Must have been because of these damn Bonapartist uniforms. Luckily, your wounds are only slight. The bullet passed through your leg and another through your chest, but you shouldn't come. The Lord must have other plans for you. You should thank him in your prayers tonight. Tonight? I must go. I have orders. You must rest. The hustle's over for you. The men will check your saddlebags for any orders you will carry. Thinking. Oh, I'll be found out.